Let us confess our sins before God and before one another. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe that there's enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the tree of life, offering shelter to all the world. Grant us, graft us into yourself and nurture our growth that we may bear your truth and love to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Well, hey, kids, I, I want to share with you something. I'm not going to read it all. I, I bet you a lot of you have this book. If you don't, I'm telling your parents or grandparents from ever to get it, because The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein is one of the greatest children's books ever. And many of you may know it, it's about a tree and a little boy, and the boy loves the tree, and the tree and the boy play and all that stuff, and then the tree keeps giving to the boy as he grows up and becomes a man. He gives the boy his branches, he gives the boy his apples, he gives the boy his trunk, until the, the tree has just left a little stump. It's been cut down to give everything to the boy as he gets older. And in the end run, the boy just, as an old man, just sits on the stump of the tree and, um, and the tree is giving everything it has to, the, to this boy as he grows up. And I thought about that because Jesus tells a story in today's gospel. And in it, he talks about giving. Now, those words aren't exactly there, but he talks about a tree. He talks about a mustard tree. And a mustard tree isn't what people would have thought was real great. But when Jesus talks about what makes it great, the thing he says is it's a giving tree. He gives shelter to the trees, to the birds and shelter to animals and gives. The good news of, of the gospel is that God is a giving tree, if you will. God gives to us, even when we don't even ask. God provides for us in so many ways through all our lives. And the goodness of God continues to grow and grow. And yes, we are asked to be giving trees to other people. But even when we don't do such a good job of it, God continues to give to us grace upon grace and goodness upon goodness. You know, it's funny, I, 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 met, I, I know the other work by this guy, by Shel Silverstein, I know it. And I think when he talks about the giving tree that I think because I've read and seen his other stuff that is very religious and talks about Jesus or shows comics about Jesus, I think when he talks about the giving tree I think he has Jesus in mind. That's what I suspect. I know when Jesus talks about the mustard seed and the mustard tree, he has God in mind because God is always, always a giving, giving God. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel I will plant it, in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it every kind of bird will live, in the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring the low, 
the high tree. I make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. The word of the Lord. A reading from Corinthians. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died, and he died for all so that those might live, live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it was sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The gospel of the Lord. Okay, so I chickened out. Here's how. I was going to show, I would have asked John Slice, our excellent video photographer, to put this in the recorded service online, or we would have put it up on the screen in church. And the recording I want to show, which was probably our video photographer's John's, he would have known it and loved it, and a few other people would have loved it, was from Monty Python. And it was, uh, for Monty Python fans like me, it was from the Holy Grail. It's when King Arthur and his knights, on their quest for the Holy Grail, come upon the knights who say, Nee! They are ten feet tall, dressed in black, intimidating for sure. 
when they say, knee, 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 it horrifies King Arthur and his knights. These knights are the keeper of the secret words, knee, ping, and knee wound. And those who hear those words seldom live to tell the tale. In order to continue their quest, Arthur and his knights are told that by these knights who say, knee, that they must bring them a gift. Now, in great quest, usually when a hero is told they have to go on a, and bring back something to, to somebody like a knight or whatever, it has to be something terribly difficult, you know, like get an egg from an eagle's nest from the top of a cliff or steal the sword of a great giant, something totally death-defying. So he expects such a demand from the knights who say, Nee! Author asks, what is it that you want? They respond, we want a shrubbery, one that looks nice and not too expensive. Now I chicken out because a lot of you just don't find that funny and would have watched it thinking like probably like you're listening to me telling it, thinking this is just dumb. I don't get it. Now I understand that. I understand because there's lots of people out there with no sense of humor and don't understand great art when they see it. What makes it funny, what the basis of the humor is this, to strange people like me and others, is that they have said that they must do something large, expecting something quite extraordinary, and instead they are told to get a shrubbery, something quite ordinary. It is the unexpected request that goes against the conventions of the scene. Now, Jesus was not writing a Monty Python skit. I understand that. But there are elements of it, in today's parables at least. Both of them have elements of sarcasm that, as one commentator put it, probably made Jesus' first audience just chuckle when they heard it. His parables, at least especially the second one, goes against the expectation of the scene, if you will. And the first actually works to set up the second. I mean, Jesus proclaims, the kingdom of God, which right away has all sorts of expectations. But he says, the kingdom of God will grow, will surely grow as surely as a seed planted in the soil. This image of the seed that was well known and obvious that, that the kingdom of God is inevitable is, however, a bold statement. I mean, first off, farming was a very risky business. There are plenty of times when the poor farmers planted seeds only to have heat waves or too much rain or whatever, destroy everything. There would have been plenty then and plenty when Mark told this parable and plenty today who would have said, the kingdom of God, have you looked around lately? But it wasn't like Jesus wasn't aware of that. That is exactly why he told such a short, pithy parable that despite the evidence to the contrary, the seed has been planted and it will, it will grow. There was a good commentary and work in preaching, preacher that spoke of exactly this, and I'm calling upon some of it. The irony and the promise of the story, but a, but a promise that is not exactly what we expect. First, Jesus says God's reign resembles a mustard seed. I imagine many of you have heard this before, but it bears repeating. It's an important part of of the message. This is not the kind of crop most people would have sow. Where Jesus lived, mustard was prolific, like a common and sturdy weed. It could pop up almost anywhere and start multiplying. This is where, as I said, some of Jesus' listeners must have eh, groaned a little and possibly chuckled. Imagine him speaking today of thistles or ground ivy or our famous kudzu. The reign of God apparently wasn't much of a cash crop yet it grows. It is not easily eradicated. Good luck keeping it out of your well-manicured garden or your farmland. Better be careful what you pray for when you say, your kingdom come, because you might get the kudzu. And second, Jesus describes the fully grown mustard plant as the greatest of all shrubs. At this point is where some of his listeners probably snorted and blew milk out of their noses. This mustard plant that Jesus is talking about can grow dense but it was hardly significant and magnificent. I mean, Jesus has to be grinning a little as he speaks. 
He is not aiming to impart insights about the relative worth of shrubberies, but to shock people into a new way of perceiving and thinking about greatness. And God knows we still need that in today's world. The humor and absurdity are part of the main point. I mean, Jesus could have likened God's reign to the cedars of Lebanon if he wanted to describe an inbreaking state of affairs that would have caused people to drop everything and be impressed if he wanted to use what the people expected. Instead, he describes something more ordinary and yet also something more able to show up, to take over inch by inch and eventually to transform the whole landscape. Fussy people might deem this uninvited plant to be too much of a, of a good thing. Maybe others might consider it a nuisance. But what about those who, like the birds, need a home where they can safely nest? This parable, like Monty Python and the Knights who say, Neep, therefore depends on satire. Just as it reorients the image of birds and majestic trees, so too it promises to, to up and to overturn our way of thinking and, and society's way of enforcing stability and keeping everyone in their proper places. The reign of God will mess with established boundaries and convention and values, will mess with the borders of all our gardens. It will get into everything. It will, it will bring life and color to desolate places. It will crowd out other concerns. It will resist our manipulation. Its humble appearance will, will expose and mock pride and pretentiousness. As a result, though, there's a history in our world of people who want to burn it all down in a pointless attempt to restore their fields and their cash crops. God's kingdom, which will be different than the world imagines kingdoms, it will, it will come to fruition. It is a promise. And the reign of God will not depend on, on humanity's ingenuity or social engineering or pietistic intensity, how well we pray, or moral virtues, if we could be good enough to bring it around. It, it exposes and ultimately replaces systems of of dominance and servitude in our world, but also in our daily relationships. We, we talk about the world so much, but how about just in our daily relationships, in our friendships, in our marriages, in work and play? We can look for moments when we, when we see new shoots or new leaves spring forth and have faith. In, the, in those moments, we come to recognize God's reign, share in, in the divine blessings and join in God's commitment to have this weed this could to take over more and more of our lives. Of course, this hardly means we, we do nothing, that we just let God's garden grow and do nothing. We, we are not meant to be passive. Jesus is offering his listeners words of reassurance and hope in the face of difficulties. Difficulties they face and evidence to the contrary about the reign of God in this world. I acknowledge it's sometimes hard to see, but I believe and cling to the hope of God's garden growing. I've been reading three books by a brilliant scholar by the name of Yuval Noah Naari, who has his PhD from Oxford and teaches at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and they're fascinating. So he's a historian. I just highly recommend him. In his last book, he, he talks about the struggles facing humanity, which will be Im immense, and, and we will... Will we be able to work together to overcome them? Will nuclear weapons fall in the wrong hands? What will artificial intelligence do us? You know, there's so much going on. And he says in his first book, Sapiens, in A Brief History, he says this, quote, perceiving the direction of history is really a question of vantage point. When we adopt the proverbial bird's eye view of history, which examines development in terms of decades or centuries, it is hard to say whether history moves in the direction of unity or diversity. However, to understand long-term processes, the bird's eye view is too myopic. We would do better to adopt instead the viewpoint of a cosmic spy satellite, which scans millennia rather than centuries. From such a vantage point, it becomes crystal clear that history is moving relentlessly towards unity." End quote. 
Now, unity is not always peace or prosperity, but it might mean a step towards even greater peace and the desire and ability to provide for all. Who knows? We have such a small view. We have such a bird's eye view. And God's view is eternal. God's view is the view of promise. The plant will grow. The kingdom will prosper. And like the weed, it is, it will grow everywhere. So often in life, we want neat manicured gardens and no and we know, you know, the kinds with signs that say beans here and squash here and corn over here, but God's growth isn't like that. There's no area in our lives that is not prone to this weed, that the weed does not seek to grow in our world, of course, and I long to see it more evident, but maybe for me, often I just long to see it more evident in me, to see the progress of God's kingdom and God's growth in me. All too often I behave in ways of anger or resentment or a lack of hope or dwell on regrets in life instead of seeing God's blessings or acting in ways of forgiveness and peace. I allow the true weeds that God does not want in the garden to take hold and or long for massive cedars of Lebanon so others can take note of me. So I need to listen to this parable of promise for me as well as for the world. And trust that when all is said and done, God's promises hold for me as well. All evidence to the contrary. What I could do to help God out is to acknowledge my failures, my longing for the cedars of Lebanon and power and glory, to acknowledge the ways I've fought against God's growth in my own life, to ask forgiveness of those I've harmed and hurt in ways that made them doubt the promises of God, who made them say, come on, I don't even see this seed clearly in him but it is. So I come here to God's church, to the community, to be watered and fed. And here I also see evidence of God's weed, this mustard seed, this kudzu in you. I come to be with you, to be intertwined and intervined, to be strengthened in these promises of God and continue on our holy quest together. Amen.
let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy God, you plant the seeds of faith in every nation. Enliven your church so that the good news of your grace may root and grow throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator, even the trees, shrubs, and flowers delight in your goodness. From the depth of the soil to the highest mountain, bring forth new plants. Restore growth to places suffering drought. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Judge of nations, we pray for our leaders and those in power. Grant them the ability to regard those under their charge with humility, dedicating their lives in service to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Divine Comforter, you show compassion to those in need and provide relief to those who call on you. Bless all who suffer, especially people trapped in cycles of poverty and homelessness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign God, this house of worship belongs to you. We give thanks and pray for our church musicians. We dedicate to you the joyful noise that comes from this place, the cries of children, the melody of voice and instruments, and the songs from our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we give thanks for our ancestors in the faith who are now at home with you. We look forward to that day when we are reunited with you in your new creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us, be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.